Good morning, folks, or evening, depending on where you are in the world, west or east. Um, welcome back to World War II TV. And as, as you know, this week we are catching up on the various shows where we're postponed, rescheduled, moved about. And we are going back to talking about New Zealand at war, which we were doing a few weeks ago. And I'm delighted that my guest has joined me. Hopefully we'll see him again in uh, later in October when we discuss El Alamein. Professor Glenn Harper has been studying World War II and World War I. He's served in both the Australian and New Zealand militaries, so he's got a long experience to draw on. And we are looking at the New Zealand role in the Battle of Crete in 1941. So just before I bring him in, because we're streaming at a different time of day, if you're catching one of our streams live for the first time, well, welcome on board. And don't forget, all the information you need is in the description below. You've got to open that up and you have the links to my guests' books and websites and social media resources, et cetera, et cetera. So without further ado, I'll bring in my guest, Professor Glenn Harper. So good evening where you are morning for me. How are you today? Uh, very well, thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you for having me on your program. Well, thank you for being here. And the New Zealand involvement, Obviously, it's it's talked about in New Zealand and there's military history societies and lots of communities and people teaching it mm -hmm. like yourself there. But outside yeah. of New Zealand, I feel that particularly in the UK and US, when we're talking about the Mediterranean, when we're talking about North Africa, the New Zealand role is secondary to that, perhaps of the Australian in terms of the popular perception. But maybe even both Australia and New Zealand are kind of disregarded by a lot of British historians. Do you think it's about time that New Zealand's role got got out to a wider audience? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it is. I mean, there is um, some ignorance about just how wide that role was. And New Zealand has served in nearly every theatre of war, either on, on land, sea or, or air. Um, as an example of that, some years ago, I went to do some research in the United States on a book of Monte Cassino. And I went to a very prestigious archive in Virginia, a military archive. And I told them who I was, where I was from, and that I was doing research on the Battle of Monte Cassino. And the the archivist who was quite well educated you know said i didn't know new zealanders were at monte casino and i thought well that's one of the big ones you know that's that's mm. one of the where, where we really were so you i think you're right i think there's some um uh, a lack of uh knowledge about just how wide the role for new zealanders was during the second world war but i guess that's our fault in some ways that we haven't been good enough at telling those stories so uh, maybe that's a challenge for new zealand historians to deal with in future well, possibly. And, and again, it's also the, the point of view it comes from as well in that when British mm. historians do include the, the Anzac forces, it's kind of the, the smaller Dominion contribution. Whereas if you're from New Zealand, your contribution is huge, you know, based on the population. Of you. So it's it's all about perspectives and looking at it from different points of view. But we're talking about Crete in 1941. You've come armed with a PowerPoint, which I put up on screen. So what we're going to mm -hmm. do today, folks, is we'll do any kind of general questions about New Zealand in World War Two at the end of the presentation. If you have ones for Glenn, as we're going on, a specific about the slide that's on screen, we'll do them as we go along. But what we're really going to do is to let 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 Dr. Professor Harper do his kind of 25-minute, 30-minute presentation on Crete, and then we'll open up to questions afterwards. But any pertinent ones, we will deal with. But essentially, over, over to you then, Glenn. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, and I just would make a point that I'm going to talk about Greece as well, the Greek campaign, yeah, because with it, no, that's fine, no problem. Without the the uh, Greek campaign, certainly the Battle of Crete would not have existed for, or involved New Zealanders and perhaps not even Australians either. So um, I am going to cover briefly uh, what happened in Greece in um, in March, April, nineteen forty one, and but focus more on Crete. But uh, as I say, we need to see Crete as part of the Greek campaign, certainly yeah. for the New Zealanders and Australians. Um, Paul, if I have the next slide, please. This is what I'm going to cover. I'm going to look at um, a point Paul made about uh, raising the NZEF and its significance to New Zealand. Um, I'm going to talk about some early involvement that New Zealanders were were in, although um, not as a division. Uh, some units were involved, um, and certainly in Operation Compass in, in 1940. Then, of course, I'm going to look at the diversion to Greece from the North African campaign. The arrival in that North African campaign of a uh, gentleman called Rommel, who I'm sure most of your listeners are familiar with, and how he throws a big spanner in the works for uh, for this uh, theatre of war. Going to look at Crete, uh, what happened and why, and have some type of assessment, and then you know conclude. And you know, more than happy to take questions through the presentation or at the end of it. So if I can have the next slide about raising the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, um, something to keep in mind is. Is that in 
the 1930s, um, the New Zealand Army, in the words of Howard Kippenberger, all but went out of existence. Um, there was no money for the military forces. Um, um, defence expenditure was less than 1% of GMP. And of the three services, the Army always fared the worst. The Navy, for some reason, well, the, the British supplied the ships and, and most of the men. The Air Force was particularly liked by the new Labour government because it was seen as somehow being more democratic and a modern force. The Army, to use the word, of Professor McIntyre, W.D. McIntyre, one of New Zealand's finest historians, the army was always the Cinderella of the services. In fact, in one year, it was 1932, the number serving the permanent force was less than 100 people and the territorial force had reached less than 5,000. So when war came about, I mean, then this happens from about 1938 onwards, the New Zealanders had to build up an expeditionary force capable of making a significant contribution to war effort, but they had to build it up from scratch, from a very low base. On the 6th of September 1939, uh, Cabinet authorised the uh, raising of a special force of some 6,600 men. Uh, they were to be all volunteers from the age of 21 to 35. Uh, they opened enlistment on the 12th of September and within the one day they had nearly filled all those positions so that they reassessed what they could offer and on the 13th of September 1939 they offered to the UK government a fully trained uh, division but because there were not enough training grounds in New Zealand and not enough uh, soldiers uh, with experience to train them they would have to be raised in three separate echelons and it would take some time uh, before that division would be ready to see any action and they also needed to find somebody to command it and this may seem a bit unusual and I think it is unusual the, compared with what happened in the First World War, the government didn't have any faith in its existing senior New Zealand Army officers so they, uh, General Freiburg who'd been a um, he had lived in New Zealand for some time, but had served all his military um, military life with the British forces, made an offer, uh, made himself available. He'd been invalided out of the British Army in the mid-1930s. And lo and behold, the New Zealand government appointed General Freiburg as the general officer commanding the New Zealand Expeditionary Force and the general officer who would command the division in action. What they did do, which is a little unusual from the First World War, was that they issued Freiburg with what has come to be known as the Freiburg Charter, where he could refuse military operations if he thought they were too risky, or he could refer the matter to his government. It was meant to preserve the independence of the New Zealand Expeditionary Force as a separate independent army, not part of the British forces, even though they would serve alongside them and be under command for operational purposes. It kept their independence. I have to say, Freiburg really was not aware of that power that he'd been given, um, and that really comes to a head in the Battle of Greece and Crete. If I could have the next slide, uh, please. And just a quick question for you, Glenn. Yeah. As someone who studied both world wars and served in, in various militaries, and maybe it's a difficult question to answer, but kind of on a scale of one to 10, kind of how modernized was the New Zealand military by 1939? Was it still very much left over from First World War thinking? Had they been following what was happening in the 30s in Britain with tanks or were they taking, looking over their shoulder at what's been happening in, in the US or Japan? Kind of where, where but, was their readiness? Uh, well, it, it, that's a, a very good question. Um, it's bottomless pit, I understand. I no, no, no. It. Well, intellectually, they had kept up with current British doctrine. You know, they were given uh, British doctrine pamphlets and so forth. And most of the senior commanders, including Kimberger, studied military history and, and, you know, had served in the First World War. Operationally and in terms of equipment, they were way behind the eight ball. There just wasn't enough um, not, wasn't enough money to uh, supply them, and that's why they had to uh, raise these echelons separately and deploy them uh, months after each other. Um, and the, in 1939, even 1940, they had far more horses uh, in the New Zealand military than they had motorised 
vehicles uh, is just the fact that that um, you know they didn't have the money um, and the resources to to actually equip a modern army, and that's why it's and this is one point I'll be making later on in the lecture. It, it takes really 18 months before the New Zealand division is ready for operation, and I'm, my argument will be they were deployed too early to Greece, and you'll see why um, during the during the course of the lecture. Good question. So thinking had kept up. But but not the equipment and not and not the training either because they hadn't had the opportunity to, to train as as these mm. large bodies large bodies of men. So we have the raising of this uh, NZDF, which is going to form uh, the division and the first echelon, which later on becomes four brigade, is uh, raised very quickly and is dispatched very quickly on the fifth of January, nineteen forty, and it arrived in Egypt uh, on the 12th of February, so just, just over, over a month later, and uh, it immediately starts training for desert conditions. Meanwhile, the second echelon, uh, which will later on become Fire Brigade, the biggest of, of, of the brigades, is raised um, and ready to sail on the 2nd of May 1940, but instead of going to join the first echelon, which is now, now uh, four brigade, it goes to the UK during a period when an invasion seems likely, and it's sent there with an Australian brigade as well to help bolster uh, up, up home forces, uh, the home defence. And that arrives in the UK on the 29th of September, and it will remain in in the UK for the rest of 1940. So basically, Freiburg has two brigades, one in Egypt one in the United Kingdom, a very divided command. Meanwhile, on the 27th of August, the third echelon, which will later on become 6th Brigade, sails for Egypt, arrives in September and starts training. But it is not until January 1941, on the 12th of January 1941, where the second echelon sailed from the United Kingdom to Egypt. It reaches Egypt on the 3rd of March, and finally Freiburg's got a complete uh, division assembled in one place. But three days later, so they arrive on the 3rd of March, on the 6th of March, elements of the division start leaving to deploy in Greece. So basically, Freiburg's had a division in one location for about three days, uh, barely assembled. They have not trained as a single fighting formation. And basically, the brigades, particularly uh, five brigade, is a stranger to the other uh, formations of the division. So basically, my argument would be they've deployed very quickly and far too early. Um, they as I say, to train, to, to send a division to an operational theatre when it's newly arrived and hasn't conducted a single divisional uh, exercise together, I think is a, is, is a uh, huge mm. mistake and something that shouldn't be repeated. Now, this is a point uh, Paul made earlier, and if I could uh, get you to move on to the next slide, uh, Paul, please. And this is the significance of the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. Um, the NZDF um, is the New Zealand main combat effort in terms of manpower for New Zealand. And the second New Zealand division makes up three fifths of the NZDF. We're talking about eight infantry battalions, an additional battalion known as the 28th Murray Battalion, and also a battalion, a, a machine gun battalion two brigades of artillery. Now from a population of just on 1.6 million, that is equivalent according to one of the official historians, Professor FLW Wood, and he's talking in relation to the population from which it's drawn. He's saying you need to look at this as a much larger contribution, the equivalent of 25 divisions in terms of New Zealand's thinking and the dangers which, in, which uh, it should be encountered should be considered on that scale. It's the equivalent of 25 divisions. And this makes, I have to say, Freiburg uh, later on particularly in the war, a very cautious commander because he's aware just how much uh, these casualties will affect the population of New Zealand. Uh, it's an important point to keep in mind. Now we move to the Italian invasion of Egypt in 1940. If I could have the next slide, uh, Paul, please. Um, as we're aware, in uh, June 1940, um, Italy makes up its mind to join the war and 
picks what it thinks think is the winning side. It takes uh, several months before they actually do anything in North Africa. Um, and of course, the Mussolini is urging them to do uh, a, a lot more than they're doing. And they finally decide to take action in September 19. 40 with a uh, invasion of Egypt from Libya um, with a considerable field force some five some seven divisions um, some 500 guns over 240,000 men um, of course facing them as Wavell's command of about 35,000 um, with uh, very few tanks no guns and very limited air cover as well I say invasion in inverted commas because the Italians advanced into Egypt for about 60 miles uh, where they halted at Sidi El Barani and dug some defensive positions and basically sat there. The Italian defensive positions were very poorly sited. They were fortified positions scattered around the desert. None were mutually supporting. There were huge gaps between them. There was no mobile reserve to plug those gaps, and it had an open flank, uh, just inviting um, something to happen. And as we know, on the 7th of December, after a careful build-up of men, logistics, a great deception plan, the British launched a raid in force, uh, which included some elite units, some of the tanks of 7th Armoured Division, the 4th Indian Division, the 6th Australian Division, and several New Zealand units, uh, particularly signalers, a railway company, and two transport companies uh, were also involved in this operation, and it was a huge success. The Italians were routed, um, forced back over the border into Libya. 130,000 uh, prisoners were taken. Uh, all the Italian tanks and guns were captured, and British losses were just, uh, were just on 500. It was a resounding de defeat. The British then pushed into Libya, but were forced to halt at Alagelia. The army commander, Rich O'Connor, was keen to continue and could have thought he, thought he could have pushed on to Tripoli, but he was ordered to halt and return most of the equipment and some of the forces back to Egypt. Um, this was a resounding British victory, um, but it was only half complete, and it also persuaded Hitler that perhaps he needed to think about sending a force um, to help out his uh, beleaguered ally in this theater of war. Now, why did they stop um, when they, you know, basically had the Italians on the run? The answer is the diversion of forces to Greece. And if I could have the next slide, please. In 1939, um, faced with uh, German expansion, uh, Britain and France uh, issued a series of unilateral guarantees, not only to Poland, but they also gave a guarantee to Greece and to Romania. Um, on the 28th of October 1940, Italy invaded Greece and suffered a series of humiliating defeats, uh, which, uh, which uh, forced their army back into Albania. But it also caught the attention of Adolf Hitler. Um, he was worried about what was happening in the Balkan region. He wanted to have a secure southern flank while he prepared his, uh, his, for his main operation, which would be Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. And the Greek, um, the, the Greek resistance excited uh, one Winston Churchill, who could see prospects of building up a Balkan front, consisting not only of Greece, but of Yugoslavia and perhaps even Turkey. And the thought of bringing Turkey into the war against Germany really, really excited him. So they decided that they would honour this uh, guarantee to Greece. They actually put a bit of pressure on Greece to actually accept it, but they could not find enough forces to send. And in the end, they sent a token force, uh, which really could do very little. And that force consisted of two complete divisions, the 6th Australian Division, the 2nd New Zealand Division, a brigade of tanks and some 80 aircraft in around eight squadrons. Now, everybody involved um, in this campaign, particularly General Freiburg and even the Australian commander, General Blamey, knew that the dispatch of this force had no prospect of succeeding at all. In fact, Freiburg wrote in his diary, and I'm quoting from it, that this deployment violates every principle of war. Yet, and here's the big, uh, the, the big but, 
Freiburg did not tell the New Zealand government of his concerns for this operation. And the New Zealand government, when it was told that, that when it was uh, informed that this operation was 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 going ahead, had assumed that Freiburg had been consulted, had assumed that Freiburg gave it the green light, had assumed that Freiburg was very happy with it, and he wasn't. Neither was General Blamey, the Australian, um, the Australian commander. Now, the Germans had uh, had been ready to attack. Uh, uh, Greece and Yugoslavia with two complete armies and we're talking about up to 27 divisions available and over a thousand aircraft. Uh, when you look at those numbers, particularly the aircraft numbers, there is no way that this token force could succeed. The Germans attacked Yugoslavia and Greece on the 6th of April 1941. Yugoslavia was easily beaten. The Greeks were pushed off, off the Metaxas line in the north. And then where the Allies had deployed, the Australians and New Zealanders had deployed around the Ali Ackman line, uh, they were easily outflanked. The first clash occurred on the 10th of April um, and the, the Australians and New Zealanders generally put up a good defence, um, but they could not hold this force. And a couple of battalions, one Australian battalion and one New Zealand battalion did not distinguish themselves at a place called Panias Gorge, where a New Zealand battalion actually broke up and ran, ran away. And the operation really became one long withdrawal. Um, if I can move to the next slide, please. Yep. Um, Thank you. Uh, this is uh, what Kippenberg has said about it. It was like one long withdrawal, more like a training exercise. Really, it became a, a, it's a lesson on how not to conduct a campaign. Now, the British Army had sent some 64,000 men, and at one stage it thought they were going to lose two-thirds of them. But through the efforts of the British Navy, they were able to evacuate uh, 50,000 of them, but not their equipment. Okay? That had to be left behind. So this is a tragedy for New Zealand. It finally has a division uh, on operations, fully equipped fully trained, well not trained, sorry, fully equipped to, to its complements, new new lorries, um, new weapons, and a lot of it has to be destroyed. And there are images of uh, New Zealanders, uh, you know, destroying their own transport, even though they'd only had them for, for a few months. New Zealand losses are, are quite heavy for, the, uh, for those that were deployed. Some 261 are killed in action or died of wounds. Some 387 were wounded. And of course, almost 2,000 are left behind. When you think that in um, you know almost five years service uh, in the First World War with just over 500 POWs, having almost 2,000 POWs came as a huge shock. The Greek campaign was a mini Dunkirk with nothing achieved except the painful lesson on how not to conduct a, to, to, to conduct a campaign. And of course, things were going from bad to worse for the British in this theatre of war. Because if I can have the next slide, please. Yep. While all this is happening, and this is, um, we're talking about March and early April, um, Hitler's taken the decision that he'll prop up or, or assist his ally in, in, in Libya, and he would commit some units, uh, some formations here, a, a minimal commitment. Initially, it would be a German light division, which eventually becomes 90th light, and an armoured division, which will become 15th panzer, but he will send one of his favourite generals, um, this Major General Erwin Rommel, and he will command what will eventually become the Deutsches Afrika. Africa Corps. Now, Rommel is a uh, thruster, a daring cavalry commander, in, in the words of one of his biographers. He was told to go there and take things quietly to build up his strength and assist his Italian allies. He was not one to do that, being this daring cavalry commander. And on the 30th of March, while things are starting to turn bleak and Greece, he surprises everybody by carrying out an attack, which easily crumbles the British frontline uh, uh, positions, which captures one of their best army commanders, General O'Connor, and pushes the British out of Libya, except for a garrison which holds Tobruk. 
This is another major setback for the Allies. So you got this happening, Rommel coming and taking some action, the Greek campaign turning to custard, that token force not able to, uh, to stop the Germans in any way, shape or form. And then we have another disaster immediately to follow. And this is the disaster of the, of, on the island of Crete. So if I can have the next uh, yep. slide, please. And brilliant Here stuff we have... so far. We love it. <laughs> good, good stuff. I, yeah, I'll, I'll try. I'm, I'll try and summarise this because I see I'm at eight twenty-five already. But no, it's fine. Just... It, it's absolutely great. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't feel the need to rush. I have just got to Crete. Okay. Here we have Crete, a large island in the eastern Mediterranean. It's some hundred kilometers from Greece, three hundred and twenty kilometers from Libya. It has some assets which uh, military people desire. A good port at Suda Bay, and all of these are on the on the northern part of the island. It has three airfields, uh, which are from west to east: um, Malemi Airfield, Retimo Airfield, and Heraklion. And for the British, if they held this island and fortified it, it would give them access to the Balkans and could possibly threaten the Romanian oil fields at Ploesti, which are very important uh, to the Germans. If the Germans had the island, that could serve as a great air base from which to bomb Egypt and the Suez Canal and would further secure their Mediterranean flank. Now, the British had been allowed to by, by Greece to garrison this island since May 1940. So they've been there for almost a year and they did very little, mainly because they've got very little forces to allocate and very little equipment to, to, which, to which they could give them. Now, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, at the end of the Greek campaign, two New Zealand brigades and one Australian brigade joined the British garrison and some 11,000 Greek soldiers there. This is the footnote to the Greek campaign. They, the troops who arrived on Crete were bewildered, to use the words of, of uh, uh, William Gentry, one of, the, one of their commanders. They only had personal weapons. They had no trucks, artillery, heavy machine guns or radios and communication was basic. They thought they were in transit, right? They thought this was used as a dumping ground, get them out of Greece, put them in a safe place and we'll come and collect them later and send them back to Egypt where, where they will do most of their fighting. And in fact, that's what their commander, General Freiburg, thought they were doing in Crete. When he arrived on the 30th of April, after staying in in Greece and being one of the last senior commanders off during that withdrawal, goes to Crete to check up on his two brigades on the 30th of April and is told, no, you, we need these troops for the defence of this island, which uh, we know is going to be next. And by the way, Freiburg, you are going to be commanding the, this, this operation. You are going to be appointed GIC, General Officer Commanding Cree Force, the other the force on Crete. Freiburg protested, said, look, I really can't do it. I've got to get my command back together. I've got to report the New Zealand government. I've got to do all these, these other things. But then he's told in no uncertain terms that that it is his that it is duty to command Cree Force and that his good friend Winston Churchill wants him to take the job as well. So Freiburg is given this command very reluctantly, and I have to say he thought at the time that if there was a serious attack on the island with the way the defences were, it probably couldn't be held. But the, the Allies on Crete had one overriding advantage, and this was the uh, breaking of the German codes, known as the ultra secret, uh, where they were reading um, German codes almost as fast as they were writing them, particularly the Luftwaffe codes. So they knew what the Germans' intentions were. The New Zealand official historian of the Crete campaign, Dan Davin, who wrote, a, the, well, I think, still, uh, history still stands the test of time, argues that Freiburg's dispositions to defend Crete were as good as he could possibly make them at the time. His orders were clear. They are to defend the airfield and the port to the utmost and deny them to the Germans. There's a critical mistake which Freiburg makes here, I think, and that is he has to defend three airfields which the 
allies aren't using. There are no planes on Crete. They take mm. off as the New Zealanders arrived. Now, Freiburg asked permission to destroy the airfields, you know, to crater them and make them unusable. And uh, the headquarters in the Middle East said, no, you can't do that. Me, we may want to use them soon. He should have just done it and apologised. You know, it's far easier to ask for forgiveness than, than for permission. And if he had destroyed those uh, German airfields, he would not have had to tie his defence to defending all three of them. Mm. So no, his orders... Just would... ask a quick question, Glenn, about, about yep. Ultra. Yeah, um, sure. Because when Matthew Wright did his show about, with us about Freiburg, that, that same qu subject came up. And mm -hmm. I wonder whether how much... We now, when we hear the word ultra, I mean, entire books have been written called yeah. How Ultra Won the War, is yeah. that we're looking at what ultra achieved from 41 through to 1945. But it, to, to be devil's advocate, in 1941, ultra was brand new. The number of people mm -hmm. who knew about it was very, very minimal because what happened, as you know, is, is each operation uh, yeah. was mounted more people were given clearance, more commanders, more mm -hmm. people. So as the war progressed, its proven worth was hmm. reading a reading reaching a wider orders but in 41 it well, it, it hadn't been proved to be the thing we would know it would become so is that a fair point oh ab absolutely and i mean it's all very well having this intelligence you know being able to use it um is a, is another thing and i think freiburg probably in terms of his dispositions and what he tried to do, I think I think the New Zealand uh, official historian is right. They were as good as he could possibly make them. I mean, right. he's been criticised for misreading them and for putting too much emphasis on the Seaborg campaign. But he, ha if, if his orders had been followed, and if, the, as you'll see later on, New Zealand uh, battalion commanders on, on the spot had not uh, evacuated an airfield and left it wide open for the Germans, the things would have been different. I think that's there, there's two critical point, uh, turning points in this Battle of Crete, which I will which I will cover, but I, I, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it wasn't that trusted source, and it took commanders even the, when when they. I mean, you look what happens in the North African campaign; they're getting these intelligence, um, you know, summaries, but they're still being defeated by inferior forces right up until Montgomery. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, having the intelligence, knowing what to do with it, are, are a couple of different things. I don't think Freiburg was ever fully informed of the source that he was getting. He was just told that it could be trusted to. It was reliable and could yeah. be trusted to the maximum. And as I say, I think he he, he put it to as, as good a use as, as possible. Now, how he did that, his orders were clear. The airfields in Porto to be defended. Units on uh, have their defensive positions, but they're to offer mutual support um, if one gets in trouble. These are his orders, are very clear. If a position is lost, it's to be immediately counterattacked. And um, so basically, you know, he is aware of how important the airfields are and how important uh, the port of Suda Bay is. On the 29th of April 1941, Hitler issued Directive uh, 28. This is uh, Operation Mercury or Operation Mercury that the Luftwaffe would occupy uh, Crete using uh, an air fleet, the 14th Air Fleet, and also uh, an air corps, and that the initial attack would be made by three parachute regiments of the 7th Air Division. In total, on the first day, some 22,000 men would be available for the ground assault, and they planned to launch paratroop and glider borne attacks in two waves. In the morning, there would be attack at Malemi Airfield and at Suda Bay, so that's to the west of the island. And in the afternoon, there would be an attack on Retamo Airfield and Heraklion in the centre and to the east of the island. And the plan was that by nightfall, all three airfields would be in their hands. They would then land reinforcements the next day by sea and by air. And all of these plans were known to the British and to Freiburg. Now, here's another, uh, uh, the other side of the sword. What uh, were the Germans expecting? Their intelligence was really poor. They expected almost no opposition, and opposition primarily from ill-trained, ill-equipped Greek forces, and they did not know how well defended these airfields and this port would be. Now, the invasion 
was launched on the 20th of May 1941, and Freiburg's intelligence was so accurate that he looked at his watch, looked at a British officer he was having breakfast with at the time, and made the famous statement, they're right on time, you know, so they, he basically knew they were coming. But everywhere the parachutists landed that morning, they suffered appalling losses. And even the afternoon, um, the parachute landing suffered losses as well. So much so that by the evening of the 20th of May, that first day, General Student uh, commanding the, the paratroopers, he thought the battle had been lost. But in two critical places, there, were, there was progress for the Germans. They were able to consolidate west of Malemi Airfield in a dried up riverbed, the Tabernitis Riverbed, where they secured a lodgement and they pressed towards Malemi Airfield. Now, the New Zealand battalion commander at the time, and remember comms were pretty basic, was out of touch with his two forward companies. He heard a lot of firing and fighting and assumed the worst. He thought they'd actually, actually been wiped out. And he asked for help from his neighbouring battalion as per Freiburg's orders. The neighbouring battalion, the battalion commander, did not actually get on with the commander of the 22nd battalion, uh, Les Andrew, so basically said, no, can't help you, you're on, you're on your own. Um, the commander uh, committed his uh, last reserve, a platoon and some eye tanks. The eye tanks broke down, the platoon couldn't advance, and he then panicked. He, he phoned his uh, brigadier, Brigadier Hargis, sitting some few kilometres behind him, told him how bad things were and that he might have to withdraw from the airfield. And Hargis is said to have said, well, if you must, you must. But he also sent two companies to reinforce uh, this battalion. The battalion commander didn't wait. And not only did he leave uh, the Malemi airfield uncovered, he also withdrew from the hill overlooking it, Hill 107 behind it. It was the turning point of the battle. Now, if I could have the next slide, please. And here we have the uh, the Germans landing. Um, you know, this is the, the, this is all taken on the, the 20th. And if I could have the next slide as well, please. Um, and here we have the where the parachutes are landing. The morning ones are to the west of the island. The ones in the afternoon are at Ritimo and Heraklion. But by the end of the 20th of May, by nightfall, the Germans have secured this foothold at Malemi Airfield and in the big hill that dominates it behind it. One of the turning points of the battle. There's another one that 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 will come up in a minute. On dawn, the 21st of May, the Germans had occupied and secured the airfield and the hill behind it. And they were able to land that afternoon some 40 transport planes. Uh, many of them were, were damaged. And there's a famous photograph of them sitting on Malemi Airfield. Reinforcements and supplies were, were landed. There was a counterattack planned for that evening, the evening of the 21st which was a very poorly planned counterattack, and it was so poorly planned that it was delayed by six hours so that when uh, the attack went in it was actually on the morning of the 22nd of may with few hours of darkness left it's been summed up as being too little too late and crete now deteriorated into one long withdrawal to the evacuation beaches over the White Mountains. You can see it on that map to a little fishing village of Svakia with another evacuation taken from the north just to, just to the east of Heraklion. And on the 27th of May, Freiburg asked for permission to evacuate, making the statement that the troops are at the limits of their endurance. There's no way that we can win this battle. Um, took a few days for that permission to be granted because Churchill thought, oh, we'll fling in a few more reinforcements and everything will, everything will, that will turn the tide, everything will, will work out well. If I can have the next slide, uh, please, Paul. Just, just quickly, we had a couple of questions about Malimi Airfield and, and the commander yeah. there. So John Palmer is saying, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew, the 22nd Battalion, is often blamed for the loss of Malimi Airfield. Is this a fair comment or a bit tough on Colonel Andrews? Uh, it, yeah, it, it's... Uh, Andrew, he doesn't have an S on his name. He's very, uh, okay. very, uh, very adamant about that. He used to spell it out to his troops so they didn't get it wrong. No, um, he he is uh, one of the New Zealand commanders to be blamed for this, and it was a command failure. But there are several others. It's not just Andrew. There are a lot of others, and I will 
uh, come up to this in the assessment, but yeah, it was Le Leslie Andrew, commander of the uh, right. 22nd Battalion, uh, war hero from the First World War, Victoria Cross uh, winner, uh, sorry, awarded a Victoria Cross First World War, uh, became a regular soldier, um, very draconian commander, um, was uh, known by his nickname February for every misdemeanor a troop committed. It was 28 days, so that's how he got his name, 28 days confined to barracks. Um, but uh, really a commander that really didn't have, I think, the tactical uh, nous that is needed at that, at that level. Um, so, yes, uh, this is a command failure at that low level at the battalion commander, but there are several others as, several others as well. Okay. So... Crete, uh, sorry, there was another question. Did you say? No, that was, it. that was that was it. No, no, yeah. I, okay, okay, yep. Okay, so it de deteriorates into one long withdrawal. Freiburg asks for permission to evacuate and it, it's received. And once again, the Royal Navy carries out another one of these evacuations, but at great cost to itself, losing several ships and nearly 2,000 sailors are in the evacuation from Crete. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, so, <laughs> On the 28th of May to 1 June is the evacuation from Crete. Some 16,500 men are evacuated, but 6,500 are left behind. Um, German losses were immensely heavy, um, some 3,300 killed in action and another 3,400 wounded. And of course, you can't forget the suffering that the Crete people endured for helping the Allies as well, and that went on for years after this, after the um, Allies left. New Zealand loss, as you can see, particularly heavy for a such a small country. And if you look at the number of POWs uh, here, that is the largest number of POWs taken in one battle in New Zealand military history. I mean, no other battle reaches that number. And as I said before, in the First World War, we had just over a total of about 500 POWs. Here we have, you know, almost almost five times that that number. So wow. what is what is the significance of this battle um, for, I guess, um, the war effort and for New Zealand? Um, Crete's strategic importance, I got to say, at the time was overstated. Um, Hitler wasn't that interested in the Mediterranean. It was Barbarossa he was focusing on. Um, it, and Taking the island meant he had to garrison it, um, you know, prov provide troops for it. And of course, there was that famous incident where the commanding general was kidnapped by uh, some, you know, some um, uh, British commandos, you know, huge, huge embarrassment. Um, but it was nearly Germany's first land defeat. The fact that it wasn't really can be attributed to, to New Zealand command failures. Starting with Freiburg, I think Freiburg has to uh, take responsibility or something he agonized over. Have to realize it was a command he never wanted. It was a command he had for about 20 days and he never had the material to be able to do it. But at the same time, he did not stamp his authority over the battle as he should have and he later on said he let gave his subordinate commanders too much leeway and he didn't see that his orders that he had issued were enforced we start with Puttick, uh, who is commanding the new zealand division but uh, there a, was a thesis done on him by one of my students several years ago called The Invisible Man, General Puttick in the Battle of Crete. Where was he? You know, he, he, he very few people know. Uh, Ingalls, uh, another commander, was supposed to um, um, assist with the commando brigade, but actually left them in the lurch so that he could, he could get out and be evacuated. Ingalls was then appointed by Freiburg to go and uh, go and tell Churchill what had happened and try and restore Freiburg's reputation a, a little bit. But Ingalls spent all his time undermining Freiburg and blaming Freiburg for the, for the loss of Crete. Not a very uh, pleasant story to tell. Hargis, the battalion, sorry, the brigade commander, uh, lethargic, not very well at the time, uh, supposedly suffering from from shell shock or some other illness gives those words he's supposed to have said if you must you must did not stamp his authority over his brigade and les andrew the commander at 22nd uh, battalion who left malemi airfield wide open and hill 107 behind it um, this was another serious defeat for the allies so you've got the arrival rommel in north africa the evacuation from greece and then crete following on from it it is a serious defeat, but there's, I think there's one positive to come out of it, and that is, according to General Student, 
Crete was the graveyard of the paratroop. They were not used in this airborne role again, except for the rescue of Mussolini, which is a very, very minor thing to be in, yeah. involved in. Now, what ha tends to happen in warfare, and it uh, happens very much uh, in certainly the First World War with the, with the use of the tank, the people who used, who invent them and use them first only see the problems with it. You know, the, if you look at the tanks, they're slow, they're vulnerable, they're smoky, but if you're on the other end of it, you actually see their potential. Now, the, the the Germans had used their paratroops, their elite troops, had suffered large numbers. Hitler says, oh, well, can't take that risk again. You know, I don't want to lose my best soldiers in that way. But the British and the Americans look at this look at this battle, say, wow, look what those paratroops did. That's a capability we need. We need to develop it. And they do. And they put serious efforts into developing their own paratroop capability, uh, which would come into their own much later in, in the war. If I can now come up to the conclusions and I'll, I'll wrap it up. I've spoken for much longer than, than I, in, I intended to. Okay, here are the conclusions from these two campaigns. It took over 18 months to build an infantry division ready for action and it had to be built from scratch. Even in March 1941, when it was used, it was not ready. And my feeling is that it should not have been deployed uh, to Greece when it was. And in many ways, this was the price paid for neglecting the armed forces, particularly the army, during the 1940s. Um, the war had started disastrously for New Zealand land forces. Uh, Crete and, uh, and Greece are absolute military disasters. I'll use Freiburg's word. Uh, Greece, Greece was a was a disaster. Crete was a tragedy, in the words of Freiburg, <clears throat> the, the commander. But Crete fell because of New Zealand command failures, and some of those commanders later tried to blame Freiburg for it. And Freiburg was almost sacked as a result of both Greece and Crete, particularly when that gentleman in the picture on the left, Peter Fraser, the New, New Zealand Prime Minister, learned from Freiburg that he hadn't believed that uh, the Greek campaign stood a ghost of a chance and violate every principle of war. He thought about sacking Freiburg. He sought advice from Wavell, the outgoing commander, and from Auchinleck, the in his incoming replacement, and both backed Freiburg. The New Zealand uh, brigadiers did not. Hargis, went to, who, was a, who was actually a politician, went to Fraser and blamed Freiburg for everything that had happened, and Ingalls did the same to Churchill. Freiburg survived this by a very narrow, narrow margin, but he was told by Fraser, you will use that charter, and if there's any operation you think that's not viable, you need to tell your government, i.e. us, and we will back you. So, And if you don't, we'll find a commander that will, will do that. But this is also part of this long chain of disasters for, for Britain, caused by poor planning, uh, faulty leadership, uh, faulty equipment, uh, and uh, also the effect of morale, on morale of defeat. And the New Zealanders had certainly experienced the taste of defeat. And I have to say, unfortunately for them, it was a taste with which they become all too familiar with, particularly mm. in, the, in the North African campaign that would follow. That's it from me. If I could have the last slide, please. And happy to take any questions or comments. Well, brilliant. Um, my first question is, is about Freiburg, because the point you just made about this being the era of, of disasters, I mean, you know, look, in, look in Singapore coming a few months mm. later and things like that. Freiburg mm. clearly didn't have his finest hour on Crete, and mm. yet he was there later on. He, he was given mm. opportunities to, mm. to fight back. He, he, he does well in North Africa. As we said before going live by Italy, he's getting a bit, frankly, a bit tired, but... Mm -hmm. There's, there aren't many commanders that really survive from the early era to, era to be there to, to, to strike back later. You, you know, I mean, obviously in the Far East, a lot are captured by the Japanese, but you know, he, he's he's if he's nothing else. He's resilient. He he he's, he comes he bounces back from his um his his shortcomings, doesn't he? Absolutely, uh, he is. He is. If I'm glad to use that word, resilient. Um, I don't think there's probably been a commander who was wounded more times than Freiburg, and mm, very yeah, seriously exactly. wounded, and um, but managed to recover for those. And is is there at the uh, at the end as, as well? I have to say though, Paul, I often uh, wonder whether Montgomery um, had summed up Freiburg's um, 
abilities. Uh, and Montgomery said of him, look, he's the best fighting divisional commander in the world, but that's the limits of his ability. Um, and if mm. you look at all the times that Freiburg gets into trouble as a commander, a Cree, for, Cree force, for example, at Monte Cassino, where he's commanding a corps, and at, at uh, Tabaga Gap um, in the Libyan campaign, where he's carrying out a big left wing, he always seems to have a bit of trouble adjusting. And I don't think he, he is a, a is as effective as a core commander as he is as this fighting divisional commander, and quite, and quite rightly he earned some fame for, for that. I just wonder, I think, if Montgomery had summed up Freiburg accurately. Yeah, it makes sense. So, well, we've got mm. a few questions. So, Ivan Sordo is asking, uh, talking about the losses in in Crete and Greece. Was conscription introduced because of these losses? You. These losses now. Reasons. Um, the government was concerned at the time that it needed to make sure people pulled their weight and, and, and would do things um, uh, and, and would actually join up. And they were aware that there would be a um, heavy price to pay for some of these engagements later on down the track. So they actually introduced conscription relatively early in the war, uh, much earlier than they did in the First World War, and, and by, by 1940. However, I would point this out too, um, conscription only applies to the army. You, everybody who served in the in the Air Force, uh, and you know, there's, there are thousands of people serving in the Air Force, volunteers, and same with the Navy. If you've been scripted, you're going to the Army, which always seems right. to struggle to keep the numbers up. Okay, thanks. We've got another question from John Palmer again saying, and I guess he's about Crete again, could a full-strength New Zealand division with all support weapons have made a difference? I think they could have made a huge difference, providing the uh, command around around the commands around the airfields didn't withdraw early, um, and you know if, if orders were followed. And to, uh, Jeffrey Cox, who was a, an intelligence officer with the division and and later headed the BBC in the in the UK for some years, actually made a comment in his book. He thought that a few radios would have working radios would have saved Crete, because this is what the, one of the problems is. Communication is dire. It's only by telephones, and the telephones are disrupted very early in the battle. So Freiburg and some of his other commands are kept blind, you know, and you know not knowing uh, what's actually happening, and that the, the commanders actually abandoned Malemia field and so on so his argument is that I, they, all it needed was a few radios so a fully equipped fully trained division with all assets including radios artilleries and and uh certainly uh, better armor support as well i think would have would have made a huge difference this was a defeat for the new, new zealanders but by the narrowest of margins it's where all these water some of these what ifs in history yeah and cre creed what, is a what what if a, a, a what if a prime example well, you know, definitely. I'm glad you made the point. We did a whole show about Operation Mercury. So from the German point of view about a year ago, I mean, it does lead them, as you said, to to, to cancel massive uh, airborne operations in the future. So the, 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 the victory they had was was a huge cost. So it changes their thinking completely. So Errol Cavett, one of our New Zealand viewers, is saying, were there any command changes in the New Zealand division afterwards? Um. And for some of the battalion commanders who hadn't performed that well. Your your audio is broken up a bit, Glenn. Your, your image is frozen. Frozen. Okay. Can you still hear me? Oh, yeah, hear you now. Yeah. Can you answer that one again? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, we're up. Uh, Battalion left after Greece. Andrew and Hajis survive, um, and, um, and uh, but Andrew later on does an, uh, does abandons a position again, and he's actually kicked upstairs. He's promoted and sent back to New Zealand. Um, uh, Hajis uh, survives as a brigadier. He's captured uh, by uh, by Rommel. It's interesting, Hard just later escaped from a uh, Italian POW camp and wanted to come back to the division as a brigadier. Freiburg wouldn't have him back. Um, so he, he's a shithole in the United Kingdom. Okay. Well, it seems that your your audio and video is breaking up a little bit now. So I think that's the the, the gods of, of um, live streaming <laughs> telling me to bring this the, the presentation to an end because I, I, it, it happens sometimes. But um, we'll we'll it's been a great first visit. Um, uh, will you be happy to come back and talk about um El Alamein later in the month? 
absolutely, yeah. Immensely, it's all good with in the. Now, well, you, you, unfortunately, you're, you're breaking up now. I don't know what's going on. The, the the connection between Normandy and New Zealand seems to have gone a bit a bit bad. So we'll we'll leave it there. But thank you very much, Glenn, for joining us, um, folks. Uh, don't forget nothing to this evening. But tomorrow we're carrying on with our Normandy MythBusters series, looking at uh, camouflage uniforms in the ETO worn by Americans. So I'll see you all for that tomorrow. So thanks everybody for watching. It's Paul Dash for World War Two TV saying I'll see you all again. Cheers. Bye.